Welcome to another in our series of conversations with Grable alumni from the 1970s. Today I'm speaking with Geraldine Balzer, an Associate Professor of Curriculum Studies in the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Welcome, Geraldine. Hi, it's great to be here and, and looking forward to possibly some reconnections with friends from Grable and back in the 70s. Let's begin way back. Uh, could you tell us where you grew up and how it was that a graduate of Rostern Junior College ended up at Grable for post-secondary studies back in the 70s rather than at any other school? So I grew up in on a farm in a rural community called Mayfair, Saskatchewan. Um, and I have learned to unabashedly admit that I was a nerd who did not uh, thrive in a small rural school environment um, and had lived with my head in books and dreamed of a world larger than the one that I lived in. So when I was in high school at RJC, um, I uh, imagined what a post-secondary education could be like and the the basic trajectory of RJC grads who were going into post-secondary was to go to University of Saskatchewan which would have worked fine and I would have lived with my grandparents which economically would have been great or they went to CNBC and somehow I had no desire to be a uh, part of that Mennonite migration. Um, I really wanted to go to university in Vancouver and my parents could not imagine that as a possibility. Um, well, my best friend and I really, really, really wanted to go to university in Switzerland, but we knew that that wasn't even approachable. So we had kind of, I'd kind of settled on, on USASC and she'd settled on CNBC. And we were talking with another one of our, our classmates who said, hey, I'm going to the University of Waterloo. Um, there's a Mennonite college there, Conrad Grable College, and um, you should come with me. And we went, oh, and he's going, yeah, my uncle's a prof there. So I, my girlfriend and I, we each went to our respective homes for the weekend. I said to my parents, I think I want to do this, like knowing, I mean, pre-internet, knowing nothing beyond my friend's recommendation. However, his uncle was Walter Clausen, who had been at RJC with my father. Um, so we now ended up in a situation where while it was farther away than UBC, it was Mennonite and my parents knew somebody there. And so it seemed safer. So uh, my girlfriend and I both got in and we boarded a train in Saskatoon and traveled, uh, you know, traveled across the country. Um, she had been to Waterloo once before to visit relatives. I had never been east of Winnipeg, um, but that was how we ended up at Grable. Uh, yet you earned your bachelor's degree, uh, if my notes are right, in 1980 from UBC. Right. Before returning to Waterloo for your master's degree in English three years later. Can you take us through that journey? Sure. So in my second year of university, I was at loose ends trying to sort of figure out what a trajectory, where I might be going with my education. Um, the desire to um, travel was still great. So I applied to a program uh, called Intermeno, which took me off to Europe for a year. So I lived in Switzerland and Germany for a year, loved it, um, decided to spend a second year living in Europe. So I, I actually went to the uh, Mennonite um, theological school there, Bienenberg, for the year and um, worked in a restaurant and did skiing and hiking and traveling and all of those things. And so then when I decided to, um, that two years in Europe was probably enough um, and to go back to university, 
um, all of my Grable classmates had finished their degrees. So going back to Waterloo and Grable seemed just awkward. Um, so I decided to, you know, my first instinct had been to go to UBC. And now um, I think my parents figured since I managed living in Europe, I could probably manage living in Vancouver. Um, and also they didn't have as much say in what I was doing anymore. So then I, I chose to finish my degree at UBC. Um, did that discovered that I do not like rain in November. Um, and, um, and also that I wanted to go on to graduate school. So um, I did my undergrad degree in theater arts and, and English. My um, advisor in the theater arts program uh, suggested I apply for uh, graduate degrees in English because it gave me more options in terms of of moving into uh, university level work, which is where I thought I wanted to go. And um, so I applied in a bunch of places and Waterloo offered me the most money. So I ended up back at the University of Waterloo, uh, reconnected with some a couple of Grable friends and, um, and had, a, uh, had a really great time um, through, through graduate at school and and sort of figuring out a path after that and then you headed west again right to your uh education degree at the university yeah. of saskatchewan uh in 1986 right and then you returned to usask to begin your doctorate degree there in the year 2000 so there's 14 years there that you're going to need to fill us in on at the time I think I've been seriously considering teaching overseas, perhaps with MCC or some other organization. Um, but uh, while I was in Saskatoon doing my Bachelor um, of Education, I met my husband and um, we um, embarked on a new adventure. And so uh, he took a job in a place called Holman Northwest Territories currently Ulukhaptuk, and um, we went north for a year, and uh, 14 years later, uh, returned to Saskatoon. So I taught uh, school in Ulukhaptuk for seven years, which was a, a K-9 to school in, uh, I think, the fifth most northerly community in Canada. Um, there are, it was population 400, 20 people were non-Indigenous. Um, and our first, our oldest daughter was born uh, while we lived there. Um, then the um, Northwest Territories moved into uh, a regional high school expansion. So we, all of the remote communities had K to nine schools and our, our students all had to go to Yellowknife for high school. Dropout rates were really high. Um, and so the idea came about to place high schools in the communities with, with the hope of having more kids finish. So Kogluktuk, uh, which was copper mine at the time we moved there, um, had one of the, the first high school expansions in our, uh, our region. And so I got a transfer there to be able to actually teach high school English. Again, I, I graduated as an English, French, and drama teacher, and my first job was kindergarten. Um, so it was kind of nice to um, move back into teaching high school and teaching English. Um, and so then we were there for another seven years, and, and our second daughter was born while we were in Kogoktuk. And so when, when uh, we returned, um, I realized that a PhD in English was no longer where I was at, but a PhD in education made more sense. So I actually did a, an interdisciplinary PhD combining English and um, curriculum studies. It would seem to me that these days, uh, you're right in the middle of what is becoming a really important national conversation as we look for ways to write our relationships with Indigenous peoples and other BIPOC populations. You're right, you're right at the nexus of history and education and, and how we do education going forward, given the realities of our day. 
your U of S webpage says that you're preparing teachers to be advocates of social justice and that some of your research focuses on decolonization of curricula. Can you tell us more about that? So I think, I mean, that really ties closely to my 14 years as a teacher in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut, where I increasingly recognized the imposition of a colonial education system on an Indigenous population and the, um, the challenges that that had for, for the, the students in our schools, for the educators in our schools, um, and that, um, and the colonial assumptions, you know, that I, I had never questioned about my own education. So I, you know, I, I talk about that in my, my dissertation, how one of the questions that drove me is um, my, my high school students looking at the literature we were reading and saying, where are our stories? And realizing that the, you know, their stories were not in the curriculum. So that, that has been a really significant part of the work that I do. And I've also been working um, in Central America with what's sometimes called international service learning and just problematizing the whole idea of um, North Americans coming in to solve community problems somewhere else and looking at how we can enter into uh, relationships of reciprocity um, and, and equalize the balance. Um, social justice is a really key aspect of the education program at, um, at Saskatchewan. Um, all of our students take anti-racist and anti-oppressive education. Um, and it's not an easy journey ever. Um, and I think the longer I do this work, the more I learn that I need to spend more time listening than talking. Um, and, um, uh, and thinking, thinking about um, ways that we can work toward reconciliation and realizing that reconciliation is the job of, of settler Canadians, not the job of Indigenous Canadians. And presumably you're doing a lot of that uh, in partnership with Indigenous populations as well, right? It's not, right. again, a, a, a white professor imposing solutions, uh, presumably. Yeah. And, and in with, you know, certainly in the time that, that I've been a professor, the number of, of BIPOC students has increased, seeing um, more and more uh, students from, from the Asian diaspora in our classrooms. Um, not very many Black students yet, um, but uh, really having to think about how they are positioned within within my classroom and within within the the system that they're hoping to get jobs in etc so so those are those are awkward moments for um, educators um, I think one of the things that out of our last research we really talk about we talk about a pedagogy of discomfort and so those moments of, of vulnerability and discomfort that um, have to happen in order for these, these changes to occur. Um, it's quite humbling a lot of the time mm -hmm. and we make mistakes. Yeah. Looking back, um, how did your years at Grable inform your career choices and maybe what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think about uh, my second year at Grable we had a symposium on Indigenous issues that Grable hosted. Oh, really? And yeah, and I'm not even sure how this came about, but I remember being involved in it. And I, you know, I think that there was something about um, being, you know, being a post-secondary student in the '70s, which seemed to me to be a time of of um, growing awareness of the inequities in our society and and kind of the beginnings of a social justice movement, at least for me. Um, and, and so an increasing awareness of, of, um, of 
the issues that were in our society and the need to bring about change. Um, I think Grable also gave me a solid rootedness in who I was as a Mennonite that allowed me to move beyond the, the stereotypical um, visions of, of who a Mennonite is. So, so I, I found voice for myself, um, recognized probably, you know, my, my own academic abilities, but also the, um, the joy of being able to ask hard questions and look for answers. So, and, and, you know, those conversations with, with Walter Clausen um, and, uh, you know, John Miller, various people that, that populated the space, um, classmates and, and, um, and yeah, and so uh, a love of learning and curiosity um, that, that came about because of that. So, um, and, and it, I have remained firmly uh, rooted in the, in the church throughout, throughout and, and uh, I've served on, you know, I served on the, the board of RJC and on the board of Grable. Um, my kids went to RJC and my kids went to Grable. So, so all of the, you know, those kinds of things that, that are hard to pinpoint exactly what it was, but there's something that, that connects me to Grable in a way, in a way that I'm not connected to, to the other post-secondary institutions that I've been at. Were there any other especially memorable uh, Grable moments or were there other ways in which Grable impacted you? I think that solid belief in community um, definitely came from Grable. I'd say some of the, you know, the friend that I traveled to across the country with is still one of my very close friends. Um, and another, another couple of people that I was at Grable with have, have been lifelong, lifelong friends. And I also, when my children were at Grable, reconnected into the community. I actually, my last sabbatical, I was there as a visiting scholar for, for a term. So, so made some new connections to Grable and really look at, um, and, and serving on the board as well, looking at some of the, the trajectory that, that Grable is choosing to take. And perhaps um, I, you know, as, as a board member encouraged the, the idea of moving into more diversity and and kind of expanding that, trying really trying to keep that balance between being firmly grounded in an, in an Anabaptist tradition and yet moving rec recognizing um, that we're not we don't need to be the quiet in the land and we we have a have a role in bringing about equity and 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 working on social justice issues. Um, I would say that. You know, I've seen the same thing happening at RJC. Um, that that um, revisioning the role of Mennonite institutions in our society and and what the future directions hold, so that that these will be places that ground another generation of of learners. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing your reflections with us, Geraldine. It's it's oh. been really nice to connect with you again. Thanks for doing yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. This has been this has been fun. Thanks. Thanks for asking me. Mm -hmm.